order and online. I'm happy to start, Brandon. Okay, let me just verify that uh, we're streaming and then we'll be good to go. starting to get dark earlier, I had to turn on my light. Me too. I can't believe um, it's already the middle of September to tell you the truth. Okay, so both Councilmember Nadolski and Stevens are joining us via telephone. Great. I'm still not seeing us uh, streaming on Facebook, so please stand by, I apologize. No worries. Chair Jaberko, we are streaming and we are good to go. Great news. Well, welcome everyone to the September 15th, 2020 Ogden City Council meeting. Please let the record reflect that all council members are present, um, two being just on the phone, but it doesn't make that big of a difference here in the Zoom world, but hopefully they'll be able to join us um, in the conversation. Um, so first off, I'm going to read the council chair determination to hold electronic meetings without anchor location. So in accordance with Utah Code 52.3.2074, I have determined that conducting meetings of the Ogden City Council with an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who, might, who may be present due to the infectious nature and potentially dangerous health effects of contracting the COVID-19 virus. This determination is based on the following. Utah has been in a declared state of emergency due to the novel coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 since March 6, 2020. The World Health Organization has characterized the spread of COVID-19 as a pandemic. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, has determined that COVID-19 is easily spread between or among people who are in close contact with each other through airborne respiratory droplets and may be spread by people who are non-symptomatic. Federal, state, and local health authorities recommend limiting public gatherings, wearing face masks, and following social distancing guidelines. Currently, physical distancing measures are difficult to set up and maintain in the city council chambers. Although case counts have been declining, there is some concern that cases may increase as a result of K-12 schools and universities returning to in-person classes. The council is evaluating a plan to return to the chambers that includes health and safety protocols to ensure the well-being of those in attendance. This plan will be implemented as soon as it is deemed prudent. However, until such time, based on the foregoing, all public meetings, including work sessions and meetings of the redevelopment agency, will be held electronically through September 30th, 2020. Information on how to connect to the electronic public meetings will be posted on each agenda. The public may comment during the electronic meeting during hearings or provide public input on items designated for input on the agenda. General public comments will also be taken during regular meetings. Written public comments may also be submitted through the following electronic options. Telephonic message at 801-629-8158, 
or public comment submission form at ogdencity.com forward slash public input or email at citycouncil at ogdencity.com. This statement is issued and becomes effective September 1st, 2020. I'm going to okay. change this up a little bit. Sorry. Okay. Who was that? Maybe it was some an accident. Okay, great. Well, I invite um, Vice Chair Blair to do the Pledge of Allegiance for us. Okay, thank you, Chair Chaburka. I would ask that all council members and those joining us would stand and repeat with us or at home uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. So. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and please now join me in a moment of silence. Thank you all so much. We're very excited this evening to have two recognitions on the agenda, the first being the Hispanic Heritage Month Joint Proclamation. And we have um, several visiting guests accepting this recognition. We have Elogio Alejandre, member of the Latinos United Promoting Education and Civic Engagement, or LUPEC. We have Cirilo Franco, America's, Americans Coming Together for Immigrants in Ogden and Nationwide, or ACTION. And Anna Jane Arroyo with Image Day Northern Utah. So first, I believe Council Member Hire will read the proclamation in English, and then Councilmember Lopez has offered to read it in Spanish. Yes, thank you, Chair. My Spanish is really bad, so I appreciate uh, Councilmember Lopez uh, taking care of the Spanish part, and we'll allow him to make the, the motion at the end of all of this. But let me start by declaring September 15th to October 15th, 2020, Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month in Ogden City. Whereas throughout the history of Ogden, people have come from all parts of the globe to call our community home. This rich diversity provides a community character that is distinctive from all other cities in Utah. Having a diverse population enriches our community and serves as one of our greatest assets. And whereas the individual and families who are Hispanic, Latino, and live in Ogden have a profound and positive influence on the community through their strong commitment to family, faith, hard work, and service. They enhance and shape our local character with traditions that reflect their multi-ethnic and multicultural backgrounds. And whereas the Hispanic and Latino people of Ogden strengthen our community and bring much promise to our future through their significant cultural, social, economic, and charitable contributions. Hispanic Heritage Month celebrates the histories, culture, and contributions of residents whose ancestors came from Mexico, Central and South America, Spain, and the Caribbean. And whereas in 1968, the United States Congress and President Lyndon B. Johnson passed the first resolution to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Week, this was later expanded uh, by President Ronald Reagan to include a month-long celebration from September 15th to October 15th. These dates were selected to coincide with the Independence Day of eight countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Mexico, Chile, and Belize. And whereas this commemorative month honors the influence and impact of Hispanics and Latinos in all spheres of society, uh, commemorating Hispanic Heritage Month gives each of us an opportunity to take pride in these roots and help to promote the rich and diverse and the diversity that these cultures have to offer. Now, therefore, the Ogden City Council and Mayor Michael P. Caldwell hereby proclaim September 15th, October 
to October 15, 2020, Hispanic Heritage Month in Ogden City. We express our sincere gratitude and recognition for the Latinos United Promoting Education and Civic Engagement, LUPEC, Americans Coming Together for Immigrants in Ogden and Nationwide and Nationwide Image, the Northern Utah, and all others within our community who are working to embrace Hispanic Latino cultures and improve immigration integration. Okay, um, Chair, would you like me to uh, go ahead now? Yes, thank you. Okay, well, um, it's uh, <clears throat> a pleasure and an honor uh, to uh, read the pro uh, this proclamation in Spanish. And uh, so without further ado, um, uh, esta es una proclamación conjunta del Consejo de la Ciudad de Ogden y el Alcalde, declarando el 15 de septiembre al 15 de octubre del 2020 el mes de la herencia hispana en la ciudad de Ogden. Mientras que a lo largo de la historia de Ogden la gente ha venido de todas partes del mundo para, para llamar a nuestra casa la comunidad. <coughs> Excuse me. Esta rica diversidad proporciona un carácter de la comunidad que se distingue de todas las otras ciudades en Utah. Tener una población diversa enriquece nuestra comunidad y sirve como uno de nuestros mayores activos. Y mientras los individuos y las familias que son hispano-latina y viven en Ogden tienen una influencia profunda y positiva en nuestra comunidad a través de su firme compromiso con la familia, la fe, el trabajo duro y el servicio, mejoran y dan forma a nuestro carácter local con las tradiciones que reflejan sus orígenes multietnicos y multiculturales. Y mientras que los hispanos y latinos de Ogden fortalecen nuestra comunidad y traen mucha promesa a nuestro futuro a través de sus contribuciones culturales, sociales y económicas y de caridad, y de caridad son muy significativas. El mes de la hispanidad celebra las historias culturales y las contribuciones de los residentes cuyos antepasados vinieron de México, Centro y Sudamérica, España y el Caribe. Y mientras que en 1968 el Congreso de los Estados Unidos y el presidente Lyndon B. Johnson aprobó la primera resolución para celebrar la Semana de la Herencia Hispana. Más tarde fue ampliado por el presidente Ronald Reagan para incluir una celebración de un mes, del 15 de septiembre al 15 de octubre. Estas fechas fueron seleccionadas para coincidir con el Día de la Independencia de ocho países, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, México, Chile y Belice. Y mientras que este mes conmemorativo rinde homenaje a la influencia y el impacto de los hispanos y latinos en todas las esferas de la sociedad. Conmemorando el mes de la hispanidad nos da a cada uno la oportunidad de, de engullecerse, enorgullecerse de estas raíces y para ayudar a promover la rica diversidad que estos cultivos tienen que ofrecer. Por lo tanto, el Ayuntamiento de Ogden y el alcalde Michael P. Caldwell presentan y esta proclamación el 15 de, del 15 de septiembre, de septiembre al 15 de octubre del 2020, el mes de la herencia hispana en la ciudad de Ogden. Expresamos nuestra sincera, sincera gratitud y reconocimiento para LUPEC, para IMAGE y para ACTION y para todos los demás dentro de nuestra comunidad que están trabajando para abrazar las culturas hispano-latinas y mejorar la integración de los inmigrantes. Thank you. Chair, um, I will uh, be happy to uh, make a motion then that we uh, adopt this joint proclamation declaring September 15th through October 15th, Hispanic Heritage Month in Ogden City. Second. Second. Fantastic. We have a motion by Councilmember Hyatt. 
here? And was that a second? I'm not sure who it was. Cows remember Blair made the second along with somebody else. I don't know who. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sometimes I don't see the square fast enough, and it was exactly <laughs> yeah. the same moment. So we'll say we have a motion to come higher. I have a second by uh, Vice Chair Blair to approve this proclamation. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Well, fantastic. Thank you both for reading that, and thanks so much to our guests. Um, I'm wondering, I don't know if I see Anna Jane on. Do you see her, Brandon? I do not, but I'm wondering if she's on a different account, like Stephanie Ariel Ware. If she's actually Stephanie Ware, her daughter. Oh, there we go. That's the one. That's there what I thought. Go. Okay, I'll get her on just a second. We'll get her on too. So, Olahio and Franco, usually we would, you know, do big clapping and shaking your hands and take pictures. And we really wish that we could do that with you all, but we appreciate you attending as it is. Would you like to make a statement at all? I had just a couple of, of things, if you wouldn't mind. Please. Uh, members of the city council, city administrators, and others present. On behalf of Latinos United Promoting Education and, civ and Civic Engagement, thank you for your recognition of our community. That's how we see it. Uh, thank you, uh, too, for your efforts in bringing everyone together in various activities such as the strategic planning committee where you included some of us in that committee the consortium working on improving police relations currently and other worthwhile events in the city of ogden it takes bold leadership to address issues that may not be of high interest to the larger community at, uh, at large if we all continue to do our part we will avoid huge stories that make the news statewide and nationally um, in these times, uh, that can be called a success. In the meantime, let us all work together for a better future in Ogden. Thank you so much for the recognition. Thank you. Uh, Franco, would you like to say anything? Um, yeah, I don't have a prepared statement, but thank you for um, taking the time to recognize um, a big, important part of our community. Um, this has been, Angela, I know you mentioned that you couldn't believe it was already mid-September. Uh, a lot of us already wish that this year was over with, <laughs> but, um, you know, unfortunately we don't have the celebrations, the activities that we would typically have in September because of COVID-19. However, we are working um, in partnership with Voto Latino um, in increasing um, voter registration across Ogden and Weber County. Um, we're also working with Nurture the Creative Mind um, on their Yeda Los Muertos event that uh, will still occur um, in, in the November timeframe. Uh, but um, most importantly, thank you all for taking the time to recognize, um, you know, this coming month uh, as uh, Latino Heritage Month in Ogden. Thank you. And will that event um, still be in person or is it virtual or how is that um, coming about? Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And Anna Jane, would you like to make a statement at all? Yes, I would. Thank you. Um, I would like to just express our appreciation on behalf of Image in Northern Utah uh, for the support, the continued support that we receive from Ogden City Council. We appreciate each one of you. We really do. We appreciate the mayor uh, and uh, the other representatives. Uh, we appreciate the fact that we now have um, the diversity commission back in place. We appreciate the fact that you've supported us, um, our communities in, in expanding um, the Cesar Chavez signs along with the MLK signs in Ogden. That was a long time coming. And we appreciate your support in that area. Um, we have been uh, dialoguing and uh, working with uh, the NAACP uh, along with other representatives of the community and organizations, um, LUPEC uh, Action, uh, with uh, dialoguing with the Chief of Police. As we all know, we're, we're just facing some uh, very challenging times when it comes to uh, police and uh, community relations. And we hope that our interactions and our participation in that 
and those conversations will uh, result in just a, a stronger uh, community and healthy community relations with our, our Latino, uh, Latinx, um, Hispanic communities in Ogden City uh, Police Department. Uh, we're also working with uh, Weber State University. We've established a consortium of organizations uh, to work closely with Weber State. Um, as you all know, we had a situation with uh, one of the professors there made headlines. Um, we uh, reached out to the president and we have, uh, we believe made some strides there. And so we're working closely there. Um, Image in Northern Utah is primarily involved with um, advocating for education, um, access and equ equity there, and employment issues. Of course, we address all kinds of issues and we work closely with our partners in the community. Lupec in Action, of course. Um, and, and the Diversity Commission is also working with that. Some of your representatives are actually part of our consortium and we appreciate that as well. Just a note that I want to express to you is that the Latino Hispanic community is quite concerned uh, with the existence and continued support of the Council for the Marshall White Center. There is nothing below Washington for our children and our youth. And we need your support. I don't know if you've made a trip there or visited before COVID, but if you ever have, that's a place where our children go and parents rely on. They draw the people together, people depend, and it's not just people of color. It's our people who are economically challenged. They can't afford to go long far or to Cherry Hill or any other place. That's where they go. And so we're, that's a concern of ours. I think that Ulogio uh, and uh, Cirillo would support that. And so we, we are just hopeful that you will keep that in mind as you make your planning and your budgets that we need the Marshall White Center. We need it. We hope that you recognize that, and we hope that you, you take and keep in mind how important that center it is, is to our community, communities below Monroe. You, we need your support. And again, thank you. thank you for the ongoing support that you've given us. Yeah, thank you all so much. And I just have to you know, make a comment that I just have appreciated getting to know you all. Um, you spend so much time and effort along with all the folks that are involved in your efforts um, just trying to improve the community and that certainly is appreciated. Would any other council members like to make a comment? Chair, uh, if I may, mm -hmm. I just want to also, I just want to echo Anna Jane's comments. I want to thank her for, I want to thank her and Eulogio and Franco for uh, being here helping represent uh, the Hispanic and Latinx community. And uh, I, I couldn't agree with her more about her comments about Marshall White. And uh, so just, just really uh, looking forward to continue our conversations. I know that there's a study underway uh, to evaluate uh, the, uh, the future uh, and get recommendations on uh, the best uh, way to move forward. But uh, Anna Jane, uh, just, just uh, as a comment, uh, many, many people on the council have been uh, very forceful and very uh, outspoken about basically what you just said. Uh, we've, we've been very outspoken with, with the administration, letting them know that um, the Marshall White is, uh, as you said, of uh, extremely, uh, extremely important to the community. So I just wanted to echo those comments and thank you for making them and uh, letting you know that at some point, if, if, we, if we need to get together and talk a little more about these and see in what ways we can coordinate, collaborate and, and 
even help the administration with uh, future planning and, and, and including uh, our friends from NAACP and, uh, and, 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 and like you said, other communities of, of need. Uh, looking forward to that opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you again, all of you, for attending our meeting virtually. Great. Next up, we have um, the reading of a proclamation to raise awareness about Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And we're lucky to invite Margaret Rose, uh, the Executive Director at Your Community Connection of Ogden, and Paige Davies from Weber State University's Women's Center to accept this proclamation. And Councilmember White will read it. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I am honored to read this joint proclamation. Um, I can't believe it's October, or almost October again, but uh, this is a joint proclamation declaring October 2020 Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Ogden City. Whereas domestic violence has affected members of our community and individuals throughout the world. Sadly, many victims of this horrific crime suffer in silence because they are afraid to seek help. It is crucial that members of our community feel safe and comfortable seeking help when needed. And whereas it is estimated that more than 10 million people experience domestic violence every year. While domestic violence is known primarily as physical abuse, it, is, it has many other forms, including emotional, sexual, financial, or psychological. It can cause long-term trauma to individuals of every gender, sexual orientation, race, religion, culture, and socioeconomic status. And whereas since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, Utah has seen an increase of reports of domestic violence and abuse. A contributing factor to the, to the increase in more people are staying at home. Although home is a sanctuary for most of us, it can be most dangerous place for victims of domestic violence. And whereas Domestic Violence Awareness Month is nationally recognized every October and first began by the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence as a day of unity to connect women's advocates across the country. This month is an opportunity to help our community promote and protect safety and freedom of all who seek refuge from this terrible crime. And whereas your community connection, YCC of Ogden, and the Weber State University Women's Center are dedicated to help, to, dedicated to help victims of domestic violence by providing advocacy, education, services, and resources. Through the, their programs, individuals and families can feel a sense of hope, safety, and protection. And whereas Ogden City encourages members of our community, of the community, to work together to increase domestic violence awareness. Doing so will enable members of our community to feel safe and secure. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Ogden City Council and Mayor Michael P. Caldwell hereby proclaim October 2020 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Ogden City. We encourage residents, schools, businesses, and community groups to recognize the importance of domestic violence awareness. We appreciate the efforts of YCC of Ogden, Weber State University's Women's Center and all other institution and institutions and organizations that encourage this domestic violence awareness throughout our community. And with that, I would like to adopt the joint proclamation declaring October 2020 Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I second it. I have a motion by Council Member White and a second by Council Member Stevens to adopt the proclamation. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us, Margaret and Paige. Um, like I was just saying with the last um, proclamation, normally we would have a you know handshake and a photo and some time together, but we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Would you like to say anything, Margaret? Oh, sure. Um, thank you, Chair Choburka. I appreciate the proclamation and, and thank you, Council Member White um, and Mayor Caldwell. Um, 
You know, I, I can appreciate that proclamations generally, um, they run the gamut, certainly from celebratory to, uh, to challenging, and that the city council is willing to not sort of dismiss the challenging ones and actually take those on and help us raise awareness um, speaks, speaks volumes, frankly. And I appreciate that partnership and, and the, the courage that the council has shown um, and that the city has, has shown um, through this particularly challenging time right now. Um, I think the, you know, the city are certainly our OPD partners, um, the city, you city officials, um, we've all seen the direct effects of domestic violence earlier this year um, with the death of off, Officer Lyday. And so we know firsthand, you all know firsthand the toll that this takes on a, on a community. And um, being willing to, you know, to work together and, and really step up and try to find solutions to, to, the, to the issues um, is what we all need to work on. Um, and it's partners like Paige with the Women's Center um, at, at Weber State, um, our, our police departments, um, you know, with the LAP training that, that is going on that's critically important um, in each one of you, um, we really you know, that's what's going to make a, a change um, in the city. So we, um, you know, I, we, we've all heard that the pandemic has certainly exacerbated domestic violence and, you know, it's sort of been anecdotal out there. And I want to give you just one stat um, that might illustrate sort of the, the gravitas of the issues that we're seeing. And, and we talk a lot, I talk a lot about the toll that, 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 um, particularly of late that it's taken in our, on our staffing. Um, not only the volume of, of calls and the demand on services, but the toll that it's taken on staff. Um, so through the first three quarters of the year, um, so July 1 to or June 30 of, of 2019 into, into 2020, um, for the first quarter, we had about 760 calls to our our crisis lines. So that was July, August, September last year. Um, quarter two, we had 613 calls to our crisis line. Um, the third quarter that included the, that included March, it bumped up to 891. But our fourth quarter from April, May, and June, we had 2,393 calls to our crisis line. So that is, that's not a little bump. That is uh, threefold, fourfold. My math is not great, but I know it's, uh, that's really significant. And I think that, um, you know, the, it's not just the number of calls, the volume certainly, but it's each one of those calls represents a person and that person needs support and case management and help. Sometimes they just need a referral. Sometimes they need a police officer, you know, so it, it runs the gamut. Um, they need safety and shelter and services, um, counseling, um, health, all that is a full package, a full complement of services that we provide and, um, and pages in the same, same situation at, at Weber State. So it's, you know, it's no longer anecdotal. It's, um, it's real. It's, uh, it's profound. Um, and it take it takes all of us um, to make a to make a difference. So we are um, yeah October's Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we're we're not unique in Ogden to um, to the to the increase in numbers we've seen it statewide. And so our partner shelters statewide, our sister shelters are are partnering together to have a virtual event on um, October seventeenth to try to do a, a statewide. Um, awareness raising. Um, and I believe, and Danette can chime in and maybe Paige, you know, it's uh, stopthevioenceutah.org. Um, and we'll be live streaming from YCC at seven o'clock on, on October 17th, uh, the event just trying, and we'd like help spreading that message on social media and, and so on. So we can definitely get more information out um, and it'll be coming shared on our Facebook page and so on. So um, I appreciate the, the commitment of the city and um, the ongoing commitment of the city, truly. Um, I know the mayor cares deeply about this and, and, and Mark um, and 
they've been very, very supportive and, and the council, thank you. So um, I, I do wanna take a second to recognize uh, two of our staff members who are listening. Um, I don't know if, if Brandon gave them speaking privileges or not, but um, Danette Stanger and, and Lisa Blake have been, uh, they manage our shelter and our victim assistance center. And they have been steady through the pandemic virtually every day at the center. So I just want to recognize their efforts. And um, anyway, they're great people to ask if you have questions, because um, I can only answer about half. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Margaret. Um, is I know that YCC is a not-for-profit organization in our community. What are things that community members can do to help support your organization? Um, obviously, there's such a huge uptick. Uh, you know, I don't know, you're probably not having volunteers now, but what are some things community members could do to help support? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, we have a wish list on our website. Um, and so we always um, are willing to take donations. Uh, obviously, it, it, it costs a lot of money to, to provide you know, as many services as we do. So we're always looking for um, financial assistance and, and financial support. Uh, support. Um, I think if you have a business um, or a skill set or um, a way that you can help us share information and help raise awareness, uh, that's always great. But I also, um, it's that old adage that if you see something, say something. Don't let, um, you know, trust your gut and speak up and if your friends need help if you need help reach out uh, there's a lot of support available uh, through ycc through the through women's center at weber state we're really the only providers in weber county um, and one of the only in all of northern utah and so uh, reach out that's what you can do to make a difference great thank you and Paige, would you like to make some comments from the weber state women's center yeah, I, I, I don't think I can say anything um, better or more, um, more than what Margaret shared about stats for the county or for the city. Um, those are pretty alarming. I think that, that if it just goes to show the good work that YCC does that also that many people uh, know and trust them to be able to reach out in their moments of need. So I think that speaks volumes to the work of YCC and the work in um, everybody of getting, getting victims and survivors help and a place to go. On campus, the Women's Center serves all students and employees of the university, and we provide services to survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, sexual harassment. Um, sometimes with our students, they might not call what they're experiencing domestic violence, that those might not be terms that resonate with them, um, but that is what they're experiencing um, it, within relationships. And so we, we provide confidential advocacy for students and employees at Weber State, some who live on campus, but the vast majority of, of the students who go to Weber don't live on campus and they're within the community. And we really am really grateful for partners like YCC to help us provide holistic services to them. I, I would also want to thank um, our partners on campus. So we have our university partners, the Office of Affirmative Action and Equal Opportunity, Weber State Police, our Counseling Department, Dean of Students, Legal Services, um, HR, and, and really just a whole slew of dedicated students who help us in doing prevention education and, and reaching out to people to let them know that that support is there. Weber State right now has students on campus, we have students online, we have them in virtual spaces. And so I just would um, reassure people that though school and university looks different um, this year, uh, we are still here and we're still serving students and still providing the same level of, of victim services to folks. Uh, I We will be participating on October 17th um, with the state uh, the statewide campaign against domestic violence. And then we also have an event on October 21st that we'll put out on our social media that's a virtual film fest. 
and we used funds from that to give money directly to survivors on our campus to help them um, with small expenses that they might not be able to cover. Uh, we Every year we give out thousands of dollars directly to our students to say, here's some money, how can we buy you a gift card for gas or uh, food for your pet or food for your kids. Um, so that is our annual fundraiser and we're holding it this October. And, it's called Luna Fest and more details will be available on our social media. But I, I think that's all I have to say. Um, a big thank you to you all and a, a big thank you to Margaret, YCC and Lisa and Danette um, for all of their work. Yes, thank you both so much. And I do see that Lisa and Danette are on the panel now. Um, I'm not sure if you wanna say a quick hi, but we do really appreciate all of your service to the community. Well, thank you. I will just be very brief in sharing my um, sentiments. Thank you to Ogden City. You guys support us during Domestic Violence Awareness Month, but you support us all year long by showing up and, and supporting us and doing the hard work and making the work that we do possible. So thank you so much. Hi. I don't know what, how much more I can add. Hi, Angela. It's been so long, huh? <laughs> um, Anyway, I just really appreciate Ogden City's commitment to domestic violence awareness um, and the safety of all of its residents. I can't really add much more than um, what Margaret Rose, Danette, and Paige have said, but I just appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you. I saw that the mayor popped on. Did you want to make some comments, Mayor? Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> okay. I am on mute. There you go. But I'd just like to add my gratitude. Margaret, you've done a great job there, and we can't thank you enough for what you do and your patience and consistency and everything else. Thank you all so much for the services you provide to those that need it so much. And this has been an exceptional year for people. <laughs> for everybody on the Brady Bunch screen, but for you guys especially, and we want to thank you for that. And you have 100% of our support. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Would any council members like to make a comment? I'll just add my thanks. I, I have been really quite worried about the circumstances this year that have, that have uh, caused the rise in domestic violence. Um, it's nice to hear the statistic because I, I, I knew it was, it was, exponentially greater but i had no idea how bad it was and uh, i appreciate those of you who who are at the front lines and manage this thank you so much well that's danette and lisa <laughs> um, and like i said they have been there virtually every day um 24 7 so uh, they and this and the staff at, at ycc we've we've rotated we've staggered we flip-flopped we've done everything possible to um, keep our staff safe and healthy um, and our clients safe and healthy and it's been amazing but we keep dodging the covid bullet <laughs> every week <laughs> like oh there was another close call um, <laughs> so we're, we're hanging in there um, but those two right there have have done the the heavy lifting the lion's share all the metaphors that you want to to use um, it's they've been great so um and we appreciate all of you so thank like you. it just that margaret we're all in this together we yeah. <laughs> we feel that our police department feels it our fire department feels it all the council members feel it i mean it's been an exceptional year and leadership matters and having you there really is a big deal and we want you to know how much we appreciate that well thank you for saying that thank you all so much have a good evening I want to do clapping and cheering and yay. <laughs> yeah. Circle of applause. <laughs> right, we're just gonna round of applause. Yeah, go ahead. Do it while I find my agenda. Perfect. Okay, round of applause. Yay. Hey, Chair, if, before, yeah. we, before we leave recognitions, if I could say just a, a, a thing or two. Sure. Last year, last year we had a recognition of uh, Constitution Day, which is the 17th of September. Uh, in the fog of the calendar this year, we, you know, we 
it snuck up on us and we didn't get it on there. But um, I think it is an important document that we need to review and revisit once in a while. Um, I, I hope that sometime this in the next little while, we can re revisit that document and we individually we can read it and see what's in it and what's not. Um, it is the foundation of all of our of all of our laws. I think it's important that we uh, pay attention to it. And uh, interestingly enough, there's um, Hillsdale College teaches a free online course uh, for the Constitution. You can go to hillsdalecollege.com, I think, and and sign up for that for free. And and I would encourage people to do that. I didn't want to let let it get away. It's in two days, and uh, so I just wanted to mention that there's nothing to to make a motion for, but I just wanted to, to make a shout out for our great constitution. You bet. Thank you. Okay, um, up next on the agenda, we have a common consent item, the continuing of the state of emergency. Um, Janine, did you want to say anything about that or we're just gonna do the roll call? Not unless there's any questions. No, <laughs> we talked a little bit in the work session. Any questions? Great. Uh, Chair, oh. I'd make a motion that we uh, uh, adopt our common consent agenda as listed in the in our agenda. Second. Second. Thank you. Oh, I love it. I love it when there's competition for seconding. Um, we have a motion by, by Council Member Heyer, and I believe it was a second by Vice Chair Blair, with a close, close third by Council Member White, but we'll just go with the first one this time. Um, My and internet must be slow. <laughs> yeah, next time I'll let you go first. Um, this is a roll call vote. Councilmember Heyer? Aye. Councilmember Lopez? Aye. Councilmember Nadolski? Aye. Councilmember Stevens? Aye. Councilmember White? Aye. Vice Chair Blair? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Hey, and that passes. Thank you. Now we have a couple of public hearings. The first public hearing is the fiscal year 2020 to 2021 budget amendment for the homeless services advocate. And Lisa Stout, our city comptroller, will be presenting. Chair um, Chaburski, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. And is that presentation okay? Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, the one where it has like the slideshow thing, but I think we can all read it. Okay. It's, um, the, the ordinance before you tonight for consideration is to appropriate an additional $114,250 to the city budget to fund a temporary full-time position for a homelessness, a homeless services advocate for a period of 18 months. The city police department received a grant through the United Way of Northern Utah on behalf of the Alliance for the Detriment of Health. The position of homeless services advocate provides coordination between healthcare behavioral health and social service organizations to address social determinant needs and provide more sustainable continuum of care. The goal is to use a holistic process that addresses both individual and community needs when engaging with the homelessness, homeless population. The advocate will work with police and fire personnel to visit locations for these high risk individuals. Frequent to educate and assist in connecting to support in healthcare services and housing needs. Uh, the object is to bridge the gap in social needs, deal with criminal violations, and address medical needs in the community before they become severe. The annual cost of this position is approximately 76,000 a year, 47 for wages and the rest for benefits. The total cost of $114,250 is a result of appropriating the entire grant amount for a year and a half of this position. Do you have any questions regarding this budget opening? 
Chair, Chair Tobarka? Yes. Uh, I apologize. I apologize for my oversight of bringing this up uh, before the item came up, but uh, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if there is any conflict of interest with me participating on this uh, item or not, because I'm on the board of United Way. I, I don't see why it would be, because we're not the one appropriating the funds, we're accepting them. But uh, if, if there is any way that maybe someone from our, if Janine or if there is someone from uh, administration, uh, an attorney that would like to maybe offer a suggestion, I would probably just, I just wanted to just, just put that out for transparency. I might be able to answer that council member Lopez, just part of it anyway, because I was gonna mention once again, um, with this, I work for the Alliance for Determinants of Health. And um, in this particular case, I don't feel there's a conflict of interest for myself because I was not involved in the decision making um, for the funds. It's a charitable contribution that was given to the community um, on behalf of Intermountain Healthcare. And there's a local steering committee that makes the decision about putting the funding recommendation forward, which I am not allowed to vote on. And then it goes to a state level advisory committee, which then approves the funding. And then United Way of Northern Utah is just the fiscal agent because so they they don't make any final decisions or vote on that final funding in any way. So for me, I, I don't think I need to recuse myself because I have no financial or no influence on that vote, but I'll let the legal counsel also mention what they think. Uh, actually, I, I, yeah, unless I feel comfortable staying in because that, that was my feeling at the beginning. So unless someone has some strong feelings on something they want to say, we, I think we're perfectly fine to move, to move forward. Janine's shaking her head. I know, it's a lot of explanation just to say we have nothing to do with how it gets decided. Oh, there's Gary. Did you have a comment, Gary? No, I think, I think you're proceeding fine. Thank you. We really appreciate your advice. You bet. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, any other questions for Lisa before we open up for public comment? So Lisa, or, or um, uh, just really quick, I just want to clarify, you clarified it and Amy did in our, um, our work session, but this is an 18 month position. Um, we're funding the whole area is getting funded at $114,000. Um, but the, uh, but that's not a 12 month salary. That's a, a 18 month salary. Um, I just wanted to clarify that because there was some confusion and I know some constituents were had reached out. Um, the, the other um, comment um, is that this is not an ongoing funding. We don't have any funding source after the 18 months. Is that correct? That is correct. So we would have to take action if we wanted to continue that position or add that position. Is that a position that's added now into the, no, it's just a, Yep, it is just funded by the grant. Council would have to uh, include it in the staffing document to continue funding it. You kind of broke up. Say that again. Council would need to uh, add it to the staffing document. Thank you. To continue funding after the grant expires. All right. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify because we did have some people reach out to us. So thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you. And it is possible that it could continue to be funded by that fund as well if the community um, advisory board recommended it. Okay, any other questions before we open up for the public hearing? Thank you all, I know it gets a little confusing. Great, uh, Brandon, would you mind telling people how they might participate? Not at all. Um, so for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, you can participate in this public hearing regarding this item. And to do so, you would use the raise hand feature, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. And we don't have anybody joining us via telephone, so I won't bother explaining that. So with that, we will uh, start with uh, Angel Castillo. The time is yours. Please limit your comments to three minutes and state your name for the record. Good evening, City Council Angel Castillo. Um, I just wanted to voice my support and encourage 
uh, the council members to reach out directly to Chief Watt for having the vision to work with a community member to consider new ideas looking at our crisis with uh, mental health and, and unsheltered individuals in needs of service and bring on someone to part-time do something and, and getting results and then making the effort to go full-time. It's something that we should be really, really proud of as far as, this, as a, our police department is concerned and proud of the people that are doing that work. And, and I hope to um, make sure that, that the council acknowledges the work that's being done for the police department in that particular area as we've got a lot of challenges that we're looking at and I'm hopeful that the chief will continue to take that um, working with the community and considering new ways of doing things for, for public safety. Thank you. Thanks, Angel. Any other public comments? Chair, seeing no more raised hands, I will make a motion that we close the public hearing. Thank you. We have a motion to close the public hearing. Okay. And a second, and we have a motion by council member Heyer and a second by council member White. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Sorry, I spoke too soon. Thank you. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, our Diversity Commissioner Jeremy Shinoda is on the line too. I see. I really appreciate him attending our meeting. Um, great. So unless there's more discussion about this item, we can. I'd be happy to consider any motions. Chair, I'll make a motion then that we adopt uh, Proposed Ordinance 2020-38. Second. <laughs> Love it. Um, we have a motion by Council Member Heyer. I, I'm not sure. Was that a second by Council Member Stevens? Right. Thank you. I thought it might be um, to approve um, Ordinance 2020-38, and this is also a roll call vote. Councilmember Lopez? Aye. Councilmember Nadolski? Aye. Councilmember Stevens? Aye. Councilmember White? Aye. Councilmember Heyer? Aye. Vice Chair Blair? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Thank you. Yes, and I also really appreciate um, Chief Watt and the department for, you know, really um, trying something innovative out in the community to help serve the, the people here. Next, we have a, a presentation about the CARES Act grant funding <clears throat> for fiscal year 2020 to 2021, and it's a budget amendment and also an interlocal agreement. So we'll do presentations first and then the public hearing and then the action items. Chair, I would like to recuse myself from this part of the discussion uh, in as much as I have a small business that has been affected by the COVID uh, pandemic. And so I will wait for a text message to get back on this meeting. So bye for now. Thank you so much, Council Member Hire. We'll let you know. So I guess just for that, um, if anybody's watching or listening in our council rules and norms, if you recuse yourself from an item, then you usually would leave the chambers while we're discussing the item or the workroom. But in this case, um, we just leave the Zoom meeting and then join back up once the item is finished. Thank you, Chair Chaburka. I appreciate the opportunity to address the council this evening. Um, the ordinance and resolution before you for consideration this evening um, relates to Ordinance 2020-40 to appropriate $5,598,675 to the city budget to recognize additional funding from the CARES Act and to adopt Resolution 2020-25 to enter into an interlocal cooperative agreement with Weber County, allowing the city to source up to $3 million of county 
Coronavirus Relief Fund to award additional CARES Act funds to businesses and not for profit so this, I'm not sure, I mean, sometimes you're kind of going in and out a little bit, but I, I don't know what's happening because it doesn't seem like you're moving anywhere or anything. Um, so I don't, I don't know what's happening exactly. You might need to repeat just like the last portion of that sentence. I apologize. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it seems fine. And like I said, it doesn't seem like you're moving or anything. Just suddenly it kind of fades out. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is also to... Um, allow the city to enter into an interlocal agreement with Weber County, allowing the city to source up to $3 million of county coronavirus relief funds to award additional CARES Act funds to businesses and not-for-profits within Ogden City and Weber County. The, the budget opening um, proposal is to fund 50% of the second distribution from the state of Utah to city expenditures, that would be just under $1.3 million, and 50% of the, the grant from the state directly to the city um, to the uh, CARES, CARES Act business grant program. The second distribution from the state of Utah is a total of $2,598,695. The first distribution of the same amount was adopted by the council in the fiscal year 21 budget with 1.3 million planned for city expenditures and 1.3 million planned for business grants. Funding must be spent by December 30th and existing funds that have been appropriated by council have already been committed or spent. The third award of the coronavirus relief fund directly to the city should be awarded the end of September, 1st of October, and will be based on the city's ability to, um, to spend awarded funds. So we are anxious to get this budget opening appropriated so that we can continue with the programs authorized by council. The city, the City Council on authorized the Coronavirus Relief Fund Business Grant Program on June 23rd. These grants are being reviewed and awarded by Business Development and the BIC, the Business Information Center staff. Nonprofit awards have been included in this program. They are using Zoom grant applications to accept grants and also using a grant loan committee to review the underwriting and award the grants. From round one, the city awarded a total of 64 grants, 51 to for-profit entities and 13 to nonprofit organizations. The total awarded was $4.1 million with an average award of 64,000. Uh, the current proposal before you is to appropriate an additional 1.3 million added to the existing budget of 1.3 million and the county funds of 3 million that brings total funding under this grant program to 5,598,694. Only an additional 1.5 million would be available in round two um, which will open in the next day or so. City funds are being spent based on an application process within the city that uh, a division requests CARES funds justifying how they will be used to help prevent, prepare, and respond to the impacts of the public health care emergency. These are reviewed by department directors and then sent to the comptroller's office where comptroller's office, legal department, and the mayor's office uh, form a committee to review and authorize spending of, of these proceeds. Currently, the city has authorized spending for a variety of issues, a lot of them related to IT, um, some uh, 
additional improvements to city facilities to help prevent the spread of the coronavirus disease as well. The interlocal cooperative agreement with the county, which is also part of your consideration this evening, would allow the city to use up to 3 million of the county's coronavirus relief funds and reimburse the city for grants awarded under the city business and nonprofit grant program. Do you have any questions regarding either of these requests this evening? I know there were several questions in the work session. Did anybody have any additional questions or? Sure, I have a, 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 a quick question, if you could. Um, yeah. Lisa, will you, so it, word, words matter, and you use the word for-profit, for-profit businesses. Mm -hmm. Are you, you're talking small businesses that might be an LLC, that might be an S Correct. corporation. We're not mm -hmm. talking those that are distributing stocks and those kind of things, is that, or, or it could be, I guess, but I just, I want to make sure that we are not, I mean, words matter, and I think people might get hung up on the for-profit word. These, these are all local businesses within Ogden City, and they have to qualify under the, the business guidelines approved by council on June 23rd. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, um, well for this item, we do have a public hearing. Um, so um, I don't know if any new folks have joined the call um, in case they'd like to comment. I don't see any new additions. So if you'd like to comment for the public hearing, please feel free to raise your hand in the Zoom meeting. And then remember this is for this item only and um, we'd ask you to state your name for the record and keep your comments to three minutes. I guess I should say for both items, that's what I should say. Sorry. <laughs> the budget amendment and the interlocal agreement. Yes, go ahead. Seeing no movement, I um, propose we close the public hearing. Thank okay. you. I have a motion by Council Member White and a second by Vice Chair Blair to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, great. Um, so now I'd be happy to entertain any motions unless anybody has any other discussion. Chair, I make a motion that we adopt both uh, fiscal year 2020, I mean, I'm sorry, CARES Act grant funding fiscal year 2020 and 2021 budget amendment and interlocal agreement. I don't know if we have to do it two separate ones since they're listed separately. Probably. I'm yeah, sorry, they're two yeah. separate actions. The first is an ordinance, the second a resolution. Thank you. So I amend my motion to say that I, we adopt the fiscal year 2021 21 budget amendment proposed ordinance 2020 40. Perfect. I second it. So I have a motion by Council Member White, a second by Council Member Stevens to adopt proposed ordinance 2020-40. This is a roll call vote. Council Member Nadolski. Aye. Council Member Stevens. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Heyer. Oh, oh never mind. Excuse himself, yeah. Council Member Lopez. Aye. Vice Chair Blair. Aye. Chair Chaburka. Aye. And that passes. Now, if someone would like to make any suggestions about the interlocal agreement, that would be great. If there's no further comment, I'll go ahead and make a motion that we adopt resolution 20 25, authorizing the interlocal agreement with Hooper County. Second. So a motion by Vice Chair Blair and a second by Council Member White to adopt the proposed resolution 2020-25. This is also a roll call vote. 
Council Member Stevens? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Lopez? Aye. Council Member Nadolski? Aye. Vice Chair Blair? Aye. Chair Taburka? Aye. And that passes. Thank you, everyone. Chair, if I could just make a comment. Thank you for the administration and staff that is trying to manage this. The CARES funding, funding is very difficult as far as when it's coming, which tranche it's in, what can we use it for. And I just really appreciate everybody's ability to maneuver through this. And it is uh, really, really valuable money to get into the hands of our, our local businesses. So I really appreciate what administration is doing in managing this money. So thank you. Agreed, yeah. And a fast turnaround time for everything, it seems like. Okay, great. Now, um, Clint Spencer, a senior planner um, with planning, is going to be with us for quite a few reports from the Planning Commission. The first item on the schedule is for access, a zone text amendment for accessory apartments in the Central Business District or the CBD zone. Welcome, Clint. Thank you. Good evening, and I will be with you for a little bit here. Um, I appreciate the consideration that the council's taken so far tonight in the meeting. There have been some interesting discussions and, and uh, recognitions, and I appreciate all of that. Um, that being said, it's, uh, like I said, it's my privilege to be here. Uh, in place of Greg Montgomery, um, our, our thoughts are with him and his family at this time, but uh, that being said, I'll move ahead with uh, the presentations that we have before us tonight. Uh, the first, the first uh, item up from the Planning Commission uh, in terms of consideration is to amend the ordinance to allow accessory apartments for existing single story buildings in the CBD zone. So <clears throat> just in terms of, uh, of definition and, and kind of what we're looking at doing in this ordinance revision, uh, currently single well, residential uses are permitted in the zone However, the, the ordinance specifies that those can only take place above a commercial, uh, a commercial building or a commercial space. So it kind of uh, takes out of consideration single story buildings for any kind of accessory apartment or, or living or residential living quarters. So uh, <clears throat> the restrictions are that, uh, that there are several single story commercial buildings in the CBD zone and uh, the, or the ordinance limits where those will limits the residential uses currently to spaces that have to be specifically above those commercial spaces. So uh, the reasons for the ordinance is to allow some options of reuse for downtown existing buildings. And uh, this would change the ordinance to not limit residential to just, um, just above first floor commercial uses, but allow them on first floor commercial uses as well. So that being said, in terms of consistency with the general plan, <clears throat> um, this first provision here where it talks about providing for horizontal and vertical mixed use development in specific areas of the downtown. So we look at that as, as providing ground floor um, mixed use in, in terms of, and as well as vertical mixed use developments. And then new development should embody sound urban form and respect the context of Ogden's already built environment. As I said, we have several buildings that would qualify for this uh, type of provision, and there are some, uh, some benefits to it as we go through the presentation here. <clears throat> so does it restrict the plan attainment? Um, as we look at allowing these accessory apartments in these, uh, in these one story commercial areas, it does create a 24 hour downtown presence. Uh, it provides additional housing options, and then also provides some options for, um, for, sure for commercial buildings that are declining in terms of how much commercial space that is required to, to run a business. Um, and this would not change the exterior of those, of those uh, buildings, but it would retain the architectural character uh, of the, the, the single story buildings that exist in our downtown and just would add a housing component to those single story buildings. In terms of ordinance uh, considerations, the plan does encourage downtown development to build up 
rather than out. Uh, so again, this isn't taking into consideration, um, this isn't encouraging that, but it is allowing existing buildings to take advantage of this provision. And then uh, the ordinance amendment would also support this for new development and require that accessory building units to a main floor use would be above the commercial floor. Chair, can, can I ask Clint a question? Sure. Um, do, does this new ordinance speak to how these uh, residences are accessed? Uh, it doesn't speak specifically to how they're accessed. It allows them to take place, and then that the access would be reviewed in a um, in a planning. Well, if there were exterior modifications to the building, it would take place during a, a planning commission revision or if uh, there were exist existing uses that were being taken or taking place uh, without exterior revisions, it would just take those, those reviews would be done in a, in a building, um, like a building permit review process where building code and, and safety considerations would be taken into, con into consideration as well. Would it be wise to consider maybe something, some ways that, uh, a residence might be accessed that wouldn't be appropriate and, and list them as, as such. I don't know what they'd be, but, but, I, but I can tell you that I think it might be a problem if uh, you know the building was modified in, in such a way to look like a residence um, from the outside. And, and I also wonder if people are gonna be wanting to uh, access their residence through the retail space every time that, that way if they have company how, how does that work so um i i'm not exactly sure what the building code requires for that but i don't think that they could have a shared access through a retail space i think they wouldn't want to they would be required to have their own um, access you know maybe they have the install another exterior door with a dedicated hallway that leads to their uh, accessory apartment uh, something along those lines uh, as I mentioned, in terms of appearance, uh, any modification in the CBD zone for uh, exterior alterations would go through a planning commission review, and it would be reviewed um, with the, uh, the CBD ordinance regulations that we have now in place that can that protect that exterior appearance to make sure that nothing inappropriate or out of character occurs in the downtown. Um, and we, we would be looking at encouraging folks to, to utilize existing accesses to the building and, uh, and not make exterior modifications for, the, you know, for, the, for these accessory uh, apartments. I think that in terms of you know, trying to protect, protect every provision of how, um, how these units are accessed, I, uh, I'm fairly confident that there are some building code requirements um, that in place that protect that. But um, I mean, other than that, I, I do think that, well, as I stated, there, the provision of having to go through a, a planning commission uh, review for any exterior modifications to the building to make sure it takes places uh, is safe and is also uh, in character with the downtown.
Were they just there for, yeah, that one uh, up top right. That one on the corner, perhaps, but any of those ones down the street, would they even work? Um, potentially, when we'd have to look at, you know, the, the overall layout of the property, how they're accessed and where their windows might be and all that, where that might take place. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be on a case by case um, review. And as I mentioned, you know, if there were modifications that needed to take place for this kind of use uh, in a commercial building, then it would have to go through that CBD um, ordinance review to make sure that it was in character with the building and, and then as well as the, uh, the, the building inspection to make sure that the, the unit was safe. Okay. I, I guess I think I'm overthinking this, so I'm I'm gonna shut up now. Yeah, they could have like <laughs> skylights or something too, you know, wouldn't necessarily have to be a window with a view outdoors to the street. <laughs> a little daylight in there. Any other comments before we take some public input? Great. Um not sure, Brandon, if you have any thoughts, if there, well, there's one hand up. I don't think there's anybody new though. So um, this is a time for public input for this item only. So please state your name for the record and um, keep your comments to three minutes. Hey, it's Council Angel Castillo. Um, I would like to, again, commend the planning department at looking at this particular piece. And I think it's important to understand the thought behind it. Uh, what they're doing is something that is akin with the National uh, Incremental Development Alliance, small local business ownership. And, and I think the story of this is, is you have these smaller units, only about 40 of them that are gonna be able to add an apartment and why that's important with regards, if you had a donut shop owner who wants to grow his business and he has a small, accessory apartment within the shop. It allows him to save money. It allows him to live where he works. It's also super convenient. We wake up really on it early as a donut owner. Um, but it's, it's really important that we take the opportunity to allow for housing where we can and especially to build wealth. Um, small business owners that the, the way that you get there to, uh, develop wealth is through property ownership. And you might be renting this particular business, but if you have an opportunity to live there and work there while you build your business, you're going to find that path to home ownership a lot sooner than you would. Um, I, I, I'm asking you to trust your planning commission. I'm asking you to trust your planning department and the fact that they've, they've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, making sure that it's safe. And I highly encourage you to vote to support this to allow small businesses to have owners that may have apartments within their businesses. And I'd also like you to consider that um, if the business is owner occupied, as far as the apartment is concerned, maybe uh, not having a parking requirement for them since they're there and it's not an additional uh, tenant being on board. So. Uh, Thank you for your time, and I hope that you vote to pass this. Thanks. Any other public input? I'm not seeing any other hands raised, so it's not an official um, public hearing, so we don't have to close it, unless there's more discussion or questions. I'm happy to entertain a motion. Sure, I propose that we adopt uh, ordinance 2020-36 amending the, the code to allow accessory apartments. I second. We have a motion by Councilmember White and a second by Councilmember Lopez to adopt ordinance 2020-36. This is a roll call vote. Councilmember White? Aye. Councilmember Heyer? Aye. Councilmember Lopez? Aye. Councilmember Council Nadolski? Aye. Councilmember Stevens? Aye. 
Vice Chair Blair? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Thanks so much for your due diligence on that item, Clint. I know um, we asked a lot of questions and had us go back and research a few things. So I do appreciate it. I, I really appreciate the idea of, you know, seeing how this works. And I do appreciate that we're not going to force someone to have to, you know, provide a petition or apply for a petition or an exception. So thanks for the proactiveness of the planning department. Chair, I just also want to say, you know, I was one of the people that asked them to go back and look at this and, and just to find out exactly what that would what that would mean as far as a financially or fiscal uh, part of that. And so I know that many of you were ready to pass this last week, so or last couple of weeks. So I thank you, uh, Clint, and your your staff that you went out and looked. So thank you. I'll pass that on to Greg. Thank you. I appreciate your questions, Council Member White. So. All right, Clint, we're up next with the proposed subdivision ordinance amendments, the roadway classifications and streetlights. Okay. Well, after listening to Angel Castillo, all I can think of right now is donuts. So I know I was sort of thinking the same thing. If I lived <laughs> in my own donut shop, I would not be able to leave. No, I, I, I have been a donut owner before. You know, I've owned them. I don't keep them very long, so I don't own them very long, but <laughs> That'd be a bad situation for me. I'd be buying a lot of extra pants. Okay, so um, this next ordinance uh, amendment has to do with uh, basically bringing in line uh, the transportation master plan terms and, and provisions in line with our subdivision ordinance. Um, so subdivisions are the, obviously the building block of our development. They set the land patterns <coughs> for circulation and utility locations and um, they anticipate both community, local, and regional, and regional needs. You can see in the, in the diagram several different types of, of building blocks here for subdivisions. So the need for the, these amendments is the trans transportation master plan was uh, approved a few, I believe last year. Um, it had some uh, standard, standards in it that we need to make sure uh, coincide with each other in terms of terminology. Uh, there was some state legislature passed as well. So in terms of in terms of language, currently the subdivision ordinance uh, has three categories for streets, uh, minor streets, a collector street, and a major street. And the plan language uh, for the transportation master plan uh, calls a minor street a local street. There's two types of uh, collector streets and then arterial streets for these major streets. Uh, in the subdivision ordinance. So the amendment would include three different types of streets, a local street type, a collector street type, and an arterial street type. Uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of, of dimensions and, um, you know, and size considerations, and, and as well as looking at traffic movement, the other provision is Look at what's underneath the road. Where, you know, how much space are we providing for utilities to occur? Where do those occur? Where, you know, what are the, what are the sizes of the right of way that we're looking at to make sure that we can service all the residents that, that need these these types of services as we develop and adopt new subdivisions. So, in terms of a, of a local street, uh, there's two types. Needs are currently in place. One is 56 feet of uh, right of way. The other is 60 feet of right of right of way. Um, and there's the, basically the difference between those two is one has a sub, uh, has a sidewalk on one side, one has a sidewalk on both sides. And so uh, we'd just be looking at you know what types of uses are served by these uh, local streets and, and what what types should be installed with with new subdivisions as they come through. Then you have a collector street, <clears throat> which uh, so it's requiring a 72 foot right of way, which replaces um, a provision for a 66 to 80 feet. So we're making more specific uh, regulations for these collector streets to occur. And then an arterial street where you have a 100 foot right of way with 74 feet of pavement. Uh, in addition, there's we're also looking at adding. Uh, uh, provision for alleys um, and this 
picture down below, you can see where the, where the major streets occur. Let's see if I can get my laser pointer here. Maybe. So you can see where the, these major streets occur and then the, these smaller streets here are alleys. And these would service um, garages that are you know, rear loaded for, these home, for, these, for this type of, of subdivision and, and neighborhood to take place. So the, you'd have these local streets that feed into these arterial streets. The arterial streets as, as they're being uh, uh, recommended anyways would be all concrete. And so we wouldn't have any utilities underneath those. So all the utilities would still run out in the public street in the public right of way. And then these uh, alleyways would be just in private ownership to allow this circulation to, to take place where you can have rear loaded garages and then have all of your your um, your homes face the street in the fashion that's kind of shown below. This would kind of just allow some flexibility in terms of uh, in terms of development, um, especially maybe you know some some infill opportunities that could take advantage of, of these types of uses and developments. Uh, <clears throat> Cul de sacs would be limited to a maximum of seventy. 750 feet. Um, I don't think that we have a regulation in place right now in our subdivision ordinance anyways. And then it would revise the pavement width to, uh, to 96 feet with some possible reductions based on some, um, you know, some, some factors and adopted processes. Uh, and then in terms of, uh, there are, you know, there are variations for special consideration or for special conditions um, that either increase or reduce the, uh, the widths of these streets that would need to be approved by the city engineer, planning commissioner, and the mayor as well. So just giving some additional flexibility. Uh, another provision includes uh, street lighting. Uh, these would take place at, at half blocks or intersections or uh, on, a, you know, on a curve that is difficult to see around uh, those types of situations. The developer would be responsible to install these street lights along new roadways that, that are part of the subdivision process. So that being said, the Planning Commission did recommend approval uh, uh, unanimously, nine to zero. If there's any questions, I can answer what I can, hopefully. Any questions? Doesn't look like it at this moment. This item also, um, we can take some public input if anybody would like to make any public comment regarding this item, the um, roadway classifications and street lights. Not seeing any hands at this time. I'm going to talk very slowly just in case. It's really hard to read the crowd. Great. So, unless there's any more discussion about this item, I'd be happy to entertain any motions. Chair, I make a motion that we adopt proposed ordinance 2020 41. Proposed subdivision ordinance amendments. Second. Thank you. We have a motion by Council Member White and a second by Council Member Heyer to approve um, proposed ordinance. Sorry, I lost track of it. 2020 uh, 41. And this is a roll call vote. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Council Member Lopez? Aye. Council Member Nadolski? Aye. Council Member Stevens? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Vice Chair Blair? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. The next item on the proposed subdivision ordinance amendments is public meetings and small subdivisions. 
<laughs> well, moving right along, um, this is a uh, provision that uh, we're really trying to encourage simplification and, and saving some time for both city staff and for people that uh, want to do these small small lot subdivisions. Uh, we're hoping to make the process a little easier, um, a little less expensive, and uh, a little more streamlined. So. Uh, just a couple of terms to go over. A subdivision, of course, is when you take one piece of land and create uh, more than one piece of land. So uh, whether it's one or three or 10, um, and then you have a subdivision plat, and this is a recorded document uh, dedicating and providing lots for sale, as you can see in, the, in this image here down below. Um, and within these, uh, well, within the city, we have lots and parcels a lot is typically included on a platted uh, development. And this would, um, once a lot is approved, that it, it is approved for development of some sort. And then a parcel uh, could be, isn't necessarily on, on a plat, but it could also be defined by what we, uh, what we call a meets and bounds description. So where somebody just has a, uh, you know, a lot that was created at the beginning of time, so to speak, and they want to, piece that up. They don't have to go through a subdivision process. They can they can uh, hire a surveyor to do a, a legal meets and bounds where those property lines are defined uh, by a surveyor and then that's recorded at the, at the county to create that new lot. So in terms of consideration, um, state law has done away with the requirement for a public hearing for, um, for subdivisions. Um, which we are, as a planning staff, I, you know, I think that we appreciate that. A lot of times uh, in, our, in our subdivision process, uh, we'll have a, a subdivision on our, on, our, on our planning agenda with the, uh, with the statement saying that a public hearing will be held for, to consider that. And then people show up and they, they think that, oh, this is a public hearing, so I can voice my concern and, and my my opposition to it, and then it, it can be done away with. Um, however, if, uh, if a subdivision comes in and it meets all of our ordinances, then we have to approve it, uh, or we're liable to all kinds of lawsuits. So that was always kind of a conflict for folks that didn't necessarily appreciate a new subdivision that did meet all the zoning requirements, and there was really not a whole lot that could be done. Uh, that being said, we still would like to have and allow public meetings to take place for public comment. There's a lot of times that uh, the public do have a lot to contribute in terms of you know, living there locally. They can identify uh, ditch problems or unique conditions that, that the city might not be aware of. Um, that has happened in a handful of situations where uh, in a meeting, you know, something will come up that, that wasn't reviewed at the time or wasn't, uh, that you know, the city wasn't aware of. And then we can go back and address that and make sure that it's taken care of during the process. So we still intend to hold uh, public meetings for people to make comments on, but hopefully that term public comment instead of public hearing will, will give a, a better understanding of what is taking place in the meeting, uh, especially in terms of whether or not, you know, public clamor can, can overturn and, and uh, basically deny a, a subdivision from going in. So a small subdivision creates less than 10 lots, um, and we see these take place quite often in the city. Uh, right now, any small subdivision is required to go through a planning commission process, which, uh, which takes up a lot of time, like I said, for staff, as well as for the applicant. They're required to go to, a, to hire a surveyor and an engineer to, to draft up a, a plat that would allow them to subdivide the lot. Um, this is you know, when people do something as simple as what's shown here on the screen and they just want to create a small lot that, that meets the zoning ordinance. Uh, this, these amendments would help that to take place so that uh, it's not as difficult or as expensive or uh, as timely or as, I guess it doesn't take as much time uh, as it currently does to get something like this approved. It would still go, these small subdivisions would still be um, required, or they still are required to go through a public uh, hearing process and those for that hearing process would be through uh, the mayor's meeting rather than a planning commission meeting. So it can, uh, the notification I believe is for a week instead of, you know, sometimes the planning commission can 
be as far out as 45 days from the time a person makes an application. So in terms of um, adjusting a lot with utility easements, um, this can take place in a couple of ways. So anytime you record a subdivision, uh, you know, a recorded subdivision with recorded easements, anytime you amend those easements, it does have to go through a planning commission process. And that would, and you know, whether you're amending one easement or, or several or, or you know, vacating an easement, that would have to go through a planning commission process. But if these lots are, are not part of a subdivision and they just have an easement recorded over them, uh, the small subdivision process would allow them to not have to go to planning commission to move these. Uh, the, these public utility easements would be um, changed into what we call now a municipal utility easement uh, that gives the munis municipalities a little more regular or a little more control over what can take place with those. And then those can be converted to municipal utility easements and, and moved uh, if the plat has, has not been recorded as part of a, a recorded subdivision. So we feel that the provisions that we're making tonight, um, they do improve the process. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, there's a meets and bounds a type of uh, description for properties where you describe the length and direction of property lines or a record of survey map is another way that, that folks can create these small subdivisions. Um, it does save them quite a bit of time from eight, anywhere from 18 to 45 days, if not more. And then it saves staff time as well in terms of having to write up planning commission reports and doing presentations uh, and it reduces costs for everybody. So. That being said, the Planning Commission did recommend approval seven to zero um, for, this, uh, for this amendment. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them now. Thanks so much, Clinton. I certainly appreciate anything that is proactive and saves time and energy and effort. And um, is there anything um, you can foresee that would be a negative to anyone by these changes or would impact anybody and cause them an inconvenience in any way? Um, that's hard to, it's hard to think of a negative impact on this. I think that we've, we've dealt with enough of these small subdivisions and, you know, going back to somebody and saying, Hey, I know you only have a three lot subdivision, but you've got to go through this prolonged, uh, subdivision process. That's, you know, those are the things that are, they're kind of difficult for us. And that's what we're trying to, you know, help. I think when you get a larger subdivision, obviously those kinds of things are going to have a little more impact and, Folks might want to comment on those or, or have a better understanding of what's taking place. But for these smaller subdivisions, I don't think that they're, um, you know, that there's a whole lot of, of negative uh, sides to, you know, to to what we're amend, what we're proposing in terms of amendment. They still do have to go through a. Uh, they still will be they'll be noticed, and they will still have to go through the the mayor's meeting, but they won't have to go through the the planning commission meeting. Great, thanks. Any other questions or comments for Clint? I'm not seeing any green boxes. <laughs> Great, so we'd be happy to take any public input on this item. This is the item for um, Subdivision ordinance amendments for public meetings and small subdivisions. You would just raise your hand in the Zoom meeting. I'm not seeing any movement there, um, so I'd be happy to entertain any motions unless anybody has any comments. Chair, I'll make a motion that we adopt uh, proposed ordinance 2020-42. Second. I have a motion by Council Member Heyer and a second by Vice Chair Blair to um, um, adopt ordinance 2020-42. And this is a roll call vote. Council Member Lopez? Aye. Councilmember Nadalski? Aye. Councilmember Stevens? Aye. 
Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Vice Chair Blair? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. And the final item for you tonight, Clint, is the proposed zone text amendment for allowing online auto sales in the C3 zone. All right. Well, we've moved right along and I uh, appreciate your consideration and questions. So the last item tonight is uh, consideration to amend the ordinance, the C3, specifically to allow online car sales in that zone. Um, some background information for this is we have had a couple of these uh, online car sales uh, that have come to us and, and there is a you know there is an interest for this to occur in the C3 zone and this would provide and give some business owners options for for use of a, a vacant commercial space or some extra uh, parking as well. So right now uh, in the commercial zones the sale of new and used cars is not allowed in the C1 or C2 it's only allowed in the C3 zone and then used car lots uh, are prohibited in the C1 and C2 and they're conditional in the C3 zone. So this, this amendment again would only really take place in the, three, in the C3 zone and not in either the C1 or C2. But that being said, um, it doesn't currently, this, the, the ordinance doesn't allow for this to take place um, as it is. There is a, a national trend uh, with dealerships, um, both new and used, where folks want to utilize um, you know, online sales of cars, I think is, is a trend that's um, easily visible. Uh, for me, whenever I look, I'm looking for cars, that's the first place I go. I don't usually go and drive around to 100 uh, used car lots to, to find a new car for, for us. And so I think that allowing folks to, to utilize commercial properties um, certainly satisfies this trend and helps to uh, to, to fill a void that might be uh, might be present. <clears throat> um, that being said, we don't want to overburden the C3 zone with these types of uses. And so there are some regulations that we've put in place to make this a little fit in a little more in character with, with the zone itself. So automobile sales online only are subject to the following conditions. Uh, number one is they can only occur in office spaces. Uh, well, the office space should be located in only in a commercial building. So these are for only existing commercial buildings. And then the space for vehicles should be on the same lot as this, as the office. Vehicles parked on the site shall not have an attached signage, writing in the windows, or advertising to promote the sale of vehicle. Basically, we want these vehicles to look like they're just being parked there um, as a normal car. We don't want, um, you know, we, the, the ordinance goes on, and I think this, We'll talk to you on it in a little bit here. Um, okay, so the, the minimum minimum of three, and that's per state ordinance. If somebody wants to open a used car dealership, they have to have at least three designated parking stalls and a maximum of six uh, within the CBD or on a, on a certain specific site. Um, parking stalls should not be used for detailing, maintenance, or repair. Um, so no kind, you know, no, no fender work or body work or muffler, all that kind of stuff can't occur while the, the, the car is parked in the parking lot. Um, and it's only for functioning operable, operable vehicles ready for retail sales. So as we look at um, consistency with the general plan and zoning ordinance, it does expand business opportunities, specifically in that C3 zone which is uh, supported by the general plan. Um, and then in terms of the C3 zone, it provides for the sale and supply of, complete, of a complete range of retail and wholesale goods. So this would just expand what's, what already exists in the C3 and, and make that zone a little more um, open to, to these, these types of uh, trend uses. Uh, again, this just goes over the the considerations that we have talked about already. So the recommendations <clears throat> being put in, um, what being proposed by, by staff is again, this, this would only be able to take place in a commercial building. As you can see here, this, this commercial building, so if somebody wanted to occupy one of these 
these uh, this commercial space with an, with an office and then have between three and six parking stalls out, outside, they could do that. Um, the concern re regarding excessive numbers of these types of, of businesses located in one area to appear as a used car lot. So the space for the vehicles shall, should be on the same side as the office vehicles parked on the site shall not have any attached signage, writing on the windows, or anything indicating that they are for sale, essentially making them look like they're just cars parked at a, at a commercial office space or a commercial site. Um, again, this kind of goes over the, some of the regulations we've talked about in terms of what the state requires for parking for used cars vehicles. Um, the ordinance does specify a maximum of six and uh, the appearance of those vehicles has to be uh, in line with a regular looking car that would otherwise be you know, parked at, the, at a commercial site. Again, not allowing any of these types of uses, you know, detailing, uh, car washing, car repair to take place while the car is parked there. And then none of these, uh, none of these junk vehicles would be allowed to be stored on the site as well. They would have to be in good repair. Um, and again, just look and appear as a regular vehicle would look and appear. <clears throat> So some of these um, some of these uses that take place for for the for used car uh, online car sales uh, sometimes people don't even require any parking stalls on on their site even though they have they have parking stalls available a lot of them will just kind of be the middleman they'll have cars delivered by truck uh, and they they just need a, an office space to satisfy state requirements and um, and this would really the provisions that were that were requiring would not um, create something out of character with the zone that's already that we're not making something that would be incompatible or out of character we feel but we're providing for an additional use in the zone so that being said the planning commission did recommend unanimous approval for this type of use in the c3 zone if there's any questions i'd be glad to answer what i can Great, thanks. Any questions for Clint? Not seeing any. Um, so I'd be happy to take some public input if anybody has any input for this particular item, allowing online auto, auto sales in the C3 zone. Please raise your hand in the Zoom meeting to do so. Not seeing any hands. Um, so unless there's more discussion on this item, I'd be happy to consider a motion. Chair, this is uh, Council Member Lopez. I would uh, love to make a motion to adopt Proposed Ordinance 2020-43, if there is no more comment. I'll second. I have a motion by Council Member Lopez and a second by Council Member Heyer to adopt Proposed Ordinance 2020-43. This is a roll call vote. Council Member Nadolski. Aye. Council Member Stevens. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Council Member Lopez? Aye. Vice Chair Blair? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Thanks again so much for your time, Clint. Thanks, Clint. Thank Greg, our best. Yeah. Will do. Thank you for your consideration, and I'm going to go get that donut now. <laughs> oh, dear. Great. Well, up next, we have reports from administration. Um, we're happy to invite Taylor Nielsen and Justin Anderson of engineering. Um, the first item on our list is engineering standards, uh, public right of way, as built projects and street lighting. Yes. Thank you, Chair Shaburka. And we will move this along and make this brief. Um, tonight, we're bringing to you some engineering standards that need to be updated for your approval. So I'll turn the time over to 
Taylor Nelson, the Assistant City Engineer. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My apologies, I was having trouble finding the unmute button. So hopefully I'm sharing the right screen with everyone. Um, we appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, very good, thank you. No, we appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening with you, Madam Chair and members of the council, and, and of course, Mayor Caldwell and Mr. Johnson. We are uh, grateful for the, the time that we have to go through some of these standards. We're also grateful for Clint um, and his presentation. He actually has presented a couple of the items that are going to be consistent with some of the items that we will present to you tonight, which include some of our engineering standards updates and some of the site triangles. So we, we've coordinated with planning in quite an extensive effort. Um, Clint did a great job really laying out a lot of that information. And so some of this stuff will just be a repeat of that information. So we will try and go through that. And, and Madam Chair, if it's actually okay, I'd, I'd like to just present all three of these different motions together and then happy to answer any questions in a one-by-one -one basis if, if that's all right to proceed that way. I think that's perfectly fine. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. So the first item that just that we wanted to note in adopting engineering standards, uh, the state of Utah came out and amended some recent code uh, back in 2017 that said anytime that we adopt a land use code or anything else, we're required to have a, a public meeting and have a public hearing in regard to some of these standards and these changes. In 2019, they, they further changed some of that legislation to indicate that only a legislative body, such as a city council, was able to adopt some of these land use regulations. So that's, that would be consistent with some of these engineering standards, like some of the items Clint had talked about earlier, uh, which would be subdivisions, roadway dedications, and other things of that nature. And so as we've been going through and trying to make amendments and updates to our engineering standards, uh, that's why we're bringing them back before this body is to, to make sure that uh, we are being consistent and following the uh, state laws as outlined. So one of the changes that we were proposing uh, the old language uh, used to read that the city engineer was authorized to adopt these same design standards and changes. Um, we are now proposing that language changes to that the city engineer shall propose for adoption by the city council, the same regulations, design standards, and everything else. Again, some of which have been proposed to you tonight and some of the other sections. And so that's one of the first changes. The, the next change that we're putting in this same section is the adoptions of codes that are similar to what most people understand is like the International Building Code, Plumbing Code, Fire Code. For uh, our engineering projects, our public work projects, we have a couple of different standards. Um, of those is the American Public Works Association, also the American Water Works Association, and a book that we've become very familiar with for everything we do is the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Uh, we call it the MUTCD. So these are three different standards or volumes that we just wanted to adopt to make sure that we were consistent with um, our construction documents, our standards, our construction requirements, and everything else to ensure as people came and built in Ogden that they had some, some industry consistency that we'd be able to work with and work through. And these have been very helpful, especially for us to ensure that we're, we're applying correct and the most current standards and getting the best product for our city. Um, one of the other requirements we added was for as-built plans. Uh, these are the, the final plans because we know construction plans always uh, have some changes in the field. And even when we have developers coming in and installing just connections in the roadway, whether that be water and sewer, we wanted to make sure we ended up with plans um, as those uh, all, all get wrapped up and finished. And then one of the items that Clint had touched on was the streetlight installation. And we, we were going with uh, the same language and uh, code consistent to what the planning group has already discussed with you about. And so that was just another item we wanted to make sure we were consistent in, a, in the chapter with the engineering standards. The other one is, as you might have seen this picture a little bit earlier, but this was the roadway cross-section standard also that Clint showed you. Um, we, we, again, we worked together quite a bit uh, with the planning group. Uh, to ensure that we are consistent across the board in, in all of our standards and that we uh, make sure that we uh, have the, the best set of items that will not only move the most amount of traffic, but also will uh, ensure that we have great and wonderful uh, infrastructure for many years to come. Uh, one of the most important parts, as you can see within that dotted line, is we call it a water wastewater utility space. 
Uh, everyone remembers that as stuff goes underground, they always seem to forget about it, and we're the ones that always get to dig it up and find it. So we wanted to make sure that we in, in the utilities that we manage and take care of are, are able to have enough room, especially in the future, to expand or go, go wherever else we need to do, um, because unfortunately, water lines get old and they need to be replaced. Um, but, but we did uh, also include some standards for winter work, trying to really limit uh, open construction in the winter. And same with, uh, we're trying to ensure that we're, uh, again, being good stewards of our roadway and following fire code to make sure everything uh, remains and maintains safety. Again, another one that Clint had talked about was just some modifications to the site triangle. Um, we just added some engineering language to ensure consistency for maybe a couple of the different corners that aren't always addressed uh, by a, a measurement setback, but that was just to ensure that we were able to cover our bases in case that we had one of those uh, small adjustments or changes or something that maybe needed to be addressed in a, in a way for uh, engineering safety. And, and that allowed us the ability to go in and review those corners that were maybe left, which was potentially a small handful. Um, the, probably some of the, the larger updates that we had within these standards are our stormwater updates. Uh, there were some new permit language that came out from the Department of Environmental Quality uh, in relation to water quality. And that's something we take very seriously here in Ogden. And we wanted to make sure that uh, we were able to update our language to be consistent with not only our standards, but some of our uh, ordinances as well. And so we have updated our standards to be consistent with the new MS4 uh, permit requirements. And we've also added some, some new requirements for uh, rivers, streams, uh, other connections, and different items of stormwater to ensure that we are keeping our rivers and all of our other uh, local bodies of water beautiful and nice, and especially a nice place for kids that they'll want to come down and play in. Um, we also added a, a requirement for water treatment devices. Um, we updated some of our detention and retention facilities along with injection wells. Um, on your screen right now, you're seeing a picture of Grand Avenue. That was one of the most recent projects that we had done, and that has some low impact design uh, that we put in that road, and that was even prior to the state adopting some of these standards. So we were trying to show that in Ogden, we were ahead of the game, ahead of the curve, and understanding the importance of bringing some of these improvements and ensuring that we were not only bringing beautiful streets, but also taking the water quality very seriously and ensuring that we get uh, a good quality product for the city for many years to come. We also, per the, the new permit language and, and for some of the items from the state, they wanted us to add in a dispute resolution because uh, LID is a new system. And I know some of the developers were concerned that everyone was gonna have a different form of standards and they just wanted to have the ability or the opportunity to come in and, and be able to resolve uh, some disputes and some other items. And so that, that is uh, all of our presentation going through the three different items. Um, we are happy to go through any questions or items that we had or, or questions that may have come up. Thanks, and I really appreciate all these pictures of that construction um, of, um, that's 20th Street right there, 21st? I can't remember which street. 20th, 20th Street, good eye. 20th, yeah, yep. 20th. I walk across that quite a bit watching that giant project, it's so huge. Any questions for Taylor or Justin? Uh, Chair, I just, if I could just make a comment. Yes. I, I, uh, I just like to thank our engineering division of being proactive and looking uh, and, and trying to plan for the future. Uh, I just uh, enjoyed uh, their uh, presentation tonight and I think uh, it's, this shows that we're trying to be more proactive here in, here in Ogden. Thank you, Council Member Stevens. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Good job on the presentation, Taylor. Thank you, sir. We have three separate items here that we have for consideration, so we'll have to um, vote on them separately. Unless there's any other comments or discussion, I'd be happy to entertain a motion on the first item. Chair, I'll make a motion that we adopt uh, proposed ordinance 2020-46. Second. We have a motion by council member Heyer and a second by vice chair Blair to adopt proposed ordinance 2020-46. 
This is a roll call vote. Councilmember Stevens. Aye. Councilmember White. Aye. Councilmember Heyer. Aye. Councilmember Lopez. Aye. Councilmember Nadolski. Aye. Vice Chair Blair. Aye. Chair Chaburka. Aye, and that passes. Thank you. Chair, I would uh, make a motion to adopt the uh, proposed ordinance 2020-44. Uh, I second it. Thank you. We have a motion by Councilmember Lopez and a second by Councilmember Stevens to adopt proposed ordinance 2020-44. And this is a roll call vote. Councilmember White. Aye. Councilmember Heyer. Aye. Councilmember Lopez. Aye. Councilmember Dendowski. Aye. Councilmember Stevens. Aye. Vice Chair Blair. Aye. Chair Chaburka. Aye, and that passes, thank you. Chair, I'll make a motion that we uh, adopt ordinance 2020-45. Second. Thank you. And we have a motion by Council Member Heider and a second by Council Member White to adopt proposed ordinance 2020-45. This is also a roll call vote. Council Member Heyer. Aye. Council Member Lopez. Aye. Council Member Dodowski. Aye. Council Member Stevens. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. Vice Chair Blair. Aye. Chair Chaburka. Aye. And that passes. Thank you. And I just really want to thank the recorder. Um, yeah, I feel like I haven't had much of a job tonight. You I think you have to do roll call on every item. So thank you so much. Now's the opportunity to address the council regarding any concerns or ideas on any topic. Um, this is the public comments portion of the meeting. Um, so if you're on the Zoom meeting, um, we'd be happy to have you comment. I don't believe there's anybody new to the meeting, but yeah, you would just uh, raise your hand on the Zoom meeting and then state your name for the record and take just three minutes, please. Hello? Hi, Heath, how are you? Hi, good, thank you. Sorry, I had trouble unmuting again. Uh, hi, everyone, Heath Sato, Ogden resident. Um, last council uh, meeting, I was happy the mayor responded to some of my questions, um, but I had asked if um, we yet knew how much the Swift building cleanup would cost, and I don't know if he misheard my question or what, but he spoke at length about the building, but never referenced my actual question regarding who was paying for the cleanup. Um, uh, he also asked me to email him about the 24th Street Bridge issue, but before I could, I received a Facebook email. Um, from somebody at the Ogden City Council page um, and uh, that was immediately following the meeting and, and they tried to be helpful. Um, they gave me a contact to reach out to about the bridge issue and that led me to being given no less than three different phone numbers I was told to call which ended, I'm, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this too, uh, which ended in a few Voicemails left that were never responded to over the last two weeks. Um, I would like to request again that someone with more sway than I have with UDOT please try to find out if or when some real repairs will begin on the bridge. Um, I'm pretty worried about how much further that bridge will deteriorate over this winter given its current state of disrepair. Um, driving down the street right now and you'll, you'll see quite a bit of debris from the road surface scattered along the shoulder. Um, as to the Swift building question, they, they stated, the person on the Facebook message from Ogden City Council stated that Brandon Cooper had said, quote, the city has not yet received a bill from the EPA for cleanup at the Swift building. Um, it, 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 this feels like it's avoiding my actual question. I would like clarification of what this all means. Um, could someone specify if this means we expect to receive a bill from the EPA? 
or we don't even know if we'll receive a bill. Um, I would like to know if we as city taxpayers will be saddled with this cleanup expense that should have been the responsibility of the building's previous owner had this whole mess been handled with greater competence. As always, all I'm asking for is much more transparency from this administration, please. Thank you. Thanks, Heath. I lost my Zoom window for a moment. Any other comments? Not seeing any other hands raised. Um, Mayor Caldwell, would you like to make any general comments or respond in any way? Sure, I have a couple comments. I'd, I'd just like to give a huge thank you to the community. As a lot of us know and a lot of us participated in, we had a huge cleanup with a major windstorm and uh, Jay Ladder and his crew did a phenomenal job accommodating a lot of that. Um, we took care of a lot of the communities that surrounded us. And if you've driven by Park Ave, our overflow area for all the green waste and everything else, you'll be enormously impressed and intimidated by all of the things that came out. I personally took eight truckloads out of my own yard and and it was really accommodating. And we want to thank our public works group and our public works staff for everything that they've done in the last number of days to clean all the streets up, make sure everything was functional and, and people could move around. On a couple of the comments that were earlier, Swift Building Cleanup, um, it would be nice if we had a really clean, easy way to look at that. They had 88,000 containers of unknown materials and the EPA is going through that. We believe that the DOD is going to pay for a lot of that, but it's not something that's a really easy thing to do. That was a public safety crisis that I think our engineering department and economic development department stepped in and did a hero's job of, of working through. That's gonna take a little while to get figured out and accounted for. And we'll be very transparent when all of that is available and, and we put that out. Um, we think that they'll pay for a vast majority of that. So uh, we appreciate that, uh, the 21st bridge issue. Um, what we're being told is that will be resurfaced next year. And that's a UDOT road, that's not an Ogden City Road, but we're very, connected with UDOT. We've got great relationships with them and we've been working through that. Our engineering department's done a great job of figuring out what they're going to do with that and we want to give that to them. I, I don't pretend to be an engineer, um, but they've that's been on our radar for a long time and that is something that we'll be very transparent about. Um, so, uh, but again, I want to thank you to the community. If a lot of you saw what happened yesterday, people came out and droves and cleaned up our parks and cleaned up our public spaces. It, it was a big issue for us. And it seems like we're doing that every five years and our group of department directors and everyone else really knows how to make this work, get everything functional as quickly as possible. I'd put our team up against anybody in the state right now. I appreciate everything that they've done. They worked tirelessly for the last seven days to get all of that handled and taken care of and positioned so that it's of the least inconvenience to the community. And we really wanna thank all of them for what they've done to put all this together because these are not easy things to take care of and to manage. So thank you all to all the volunteers that showed up, all the community members that came in, put on their work gloves, went to work and helped take care of our community. And that's one of the things we talked a lot about is People care about their public spaces, their open spaces. We live in an amazing place, not just for our public spaces, but for the people that live here and want to go to work. And I'm really, really proud of everything everybody did. So thank you very much. Thanks. Any other comments from council members? Uh, Chair, can I take a few minutes? Yes, please. Uh, this year, 2020, is no is not like a normal year uh, and i'd like to go to the year 2021 and 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 start from there and, and continue on but uh, 
Uh, if it was a normal year, I would be making my predictions about Weber State's football uh, team. But uh, again, this is not a normal year. So um, I first would like to thank Cl uh, my thoughts and prayers go out to uh, Greg and his family. Um, and, uh, and, and I hope that, uh, that uh, they feel what we're, that, uh, what, that we're thinking about him and his family and, and, the, great, and the great loss that he had. Uh, but Clint did an outstanding job. I mean, he, uh, we worked him pretty well tonight, and, and, uh, but he, uh, he did a, a great and an outstanding job. Uh, when I was campaigning, I campaigned on a district, an art district, and this nine rails uh, kind of fulfills that uh, opportunity that we have here in Ogden. We know the importance of arts. We know that the arts uh, add a special environment, character, and opportunities to those who would like to share their talents and art with, with other people. Uh, and, and I'm very uh, mindful of that. I made a suggestion uh, this evening that we look at the nine rails, but also we look at those and develop a program by which uh, uh, our citizens and others can donate to that project so that they can feel part of the nine rails uh, project that we have going. And again, on Marshall White Center, I want the Marshall White Center to be a functional center for everyone in Ogden City. Uh, some uh, a center that we could go visit and uh, appreciate and, and uh, uh, that uh, this has to be a community center and that's what I'm looking at at the present time. That's uh, the objective that I would like to see is that the Marshall White Center is very important to me but it's also important to Ogden City as a community center that will address all of our programs and help us all to develop and, and share our talents with each and every one of us. And that's all I have to say. Thanks, Council Member Stevens. You had to make up for a couple weeks, too, not being here. Any other comments? Chair Chibberka, this is Ben, if I could. Yes. Just a quick second to huge props to every employee, every community member and neighbor that helped with the cleanup. Um, sometimes it might seem like it takes a while, but the fact that we are getting, getting back to life as we knew it before the storm is, is heroically impressive. So thanks to everybody that helped with that. Thank you. Any other comments? Chair, I, I went to the WACOG meeting yesterday and and uh, I was pretty impressed by all of the, the help that went from community to community. Um, we reached out to those who needed the help that we specialize in, others from other communities, uh, Mayor Dandoy from Roy, they didn't get hit very hard. So they, they pitched in uh, throughout the county and, and did what, what they could do. Uh, those stories go on and on. I, I think it was impressive to hear how we join arms and, and uh, tackle a problem when, when it's widespread. I, I, I think uh, it makes me proud to live in this area where people are that selfless and, and uh, look out for each other like they do. Any other comments? Yeah, well, I definitely, um, yeah, I applaud all the community members as well for sticking it out. And I really applaud those people that survived so many days without electricity. I don't know if I could have made it that many days. Um, and I think um, just another note um, for anybody that is really interested in any particular, you know, social service or community interest for the not-for-profits in the area, not only are the domestic violence calls up, I know that requests for food assistance are also up in the community and, and other items too. So if there is a not-for-profit or a social service that you're really um, interested in, I would definitely reach out to see how you might be able to help. Um, there's lots of people that are still being impacted by the pandemic and then also now the 
the hurricane. Um, so it's just a compounded issue in, in the community. And I thank you all so much for your time. If there's no more other comments, I'm happy to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn from Council Member Heyer and a second by Council Member Nadalski. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, well, have a wonderful evening, you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.